welcome Jason to Metalitum Pages. It's a great pleasure to talk with you about Misery Index, this new album Complete Control, and other things related to the Metal World. Starting with the when I when I think when I come in question, how have you been doing this during the crazy times? Because first two years the pandemic, now a war in Europe, perhaps in the, perhaps next two or three years we have a zombie apocalypse or alien invasion. Who knows what will happen in the next coming years? <coughs> Yeah, it's been, uh, yeah, as you said, it's been crazy. Um, just, uh, you know, I remember like uh, the weekend of March 12th, 2020, um, we were on tour in Europe with uh, Napalm Death and I Hate God. And uh, we were reaching the, the last week of the tour and we started hearing rumors of this, uh, you know, virus going around. And sure enough, the, uh, you know, the last, next to last show of the tour was canceled. Um, you know, we went home. And after that, we, you know, I didn't see my band for a year and a half. You know, I went back to, uh, I live in Finland these days and I went back to, went back home and yeah, and everything just shut down. And, you know, it was like everyone was saying, oh, it's going to be over by summer. And, and then summer came and went, oh, it's going to be over by the next winter. And, you know, and then wave after wave came and uh, yeah, it was just, uh, I don't want to say it was a lost time or a lost couple of years we did manage to write an album through that and just to do other projects and things but yeah here we are at the what might be the you know the last stages of it yeah and and you know now we have uh maybe world war three on the horizon who knows <laughs> yeah, yeah it's very difficult to know this time so yeah so talking about this complete control so i know perhaps do you perhaps do you compose and write in this writing process during this pandemic or was it before pretty much everything on the record except for one song infiltrators the short song which we just released on the video last week that one was written years ago and i had it laying around um until we could figure out what to do with it but yeah the other um eight songs on the record we composed um in 2020 and 2021 um up until we recorded in september 2021 and we put them all down yeah it's definitely the pandemic album for us <laughs> okay 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 so one question that i love to ask about a band like your history because you have you have more than you have eight albums, you eight albums from since the first time when you released Retaliate and now Complete Control. So usually the fans, the reviewers, and many people think that the first album is the greatest stone of the history of the band, this kind of stuff. You think like that because you are a fan musician, you think that the first album from your first bands is the best ones. Now then the, then the band changed with the sounds, with the complete everything. But curiously, and the counterproductive thing is that the new album, or perhaps the last album, uh, especially is the best ones for the band. So for you, if we're talking about this matter, do you think about like this, but how this is a, the complete control is a, like a cliche, is the best album to, to the date, or perhaps you have a lot of memories with the Retailer, Discordia, Traders, Killing God, etc. Or perhaps who, perhaps you have, a, perhaps you have one favorite around all, across your own discography. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, of course, albums mean different things to different people um for fans of course it's usually it's always the album that got you know that was the album that got them into the band the first one they heard might usually be the one they like the most I mean, i'm that way with with artists i like as well you know i've i cling to the the ones that were a part of like my life at a certain time like those are the ones that i relate to and, and think are the ones that have the most meaning for me personally you know um you know as a musician who's in the band like i would say that yeah i could see that how some albums might be better than others you know we're just far more self-critical as far as like the things that fans don't notice like production aspects that bother us or songwriting aspects where we maybe thought we maybe we should have done something different or that might have been rushed or that didn't come out the way we imagined um you know i, I do like you know i like airs the thievery a lot the 2010 record i think that one's solid even though i have i have issues with the production with all of our records. I, I just think it's just something like you can 
you know, records are kind of like your baby, you know, and you just want them to be perfect or something. And all I think it's impossible to like, in a way, to please your your creative like uh, drive or whatever your creative to satisfy that creative like aspect 100% because you're. I don't know. Maybe you're just like always striving to do something better, but I will say Complete Control is our best record to an extent. <laughs> At least it is in my short rear view window right now. It's kind of like, yeah, this is the one that you know, production wise, we feel like we got it right. We finally, you know, managed to balance the natural aspects of recording with the technology and to get really capture real natural sounds. So, in that regard, we're stoked. And yeah, we're stoked about it. The song we're writing, too. So, let's we'll see if it stands the test of time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I hear, to do this interview, I hear all albums from Mr. Enix since the beginning, Regali, Discordia, Traitors, and to this complete control. And I am. And you have you achieve a sound. You have your personal sound during the, all these during all these years. So for you, how difficult is for you to maintain the sound, but at the same time not repeat by yourself and think do different things in each album because it's very difficult for a musician like you. With we have a lot of albums you previously played with in you previously playing playing giant fetus. So you have a lot of history in there. It's very difficult sometimes to. To keep to keep to keep something fresh and then not repeat by yourself. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, when Misery Next started, it, we had a specific vision. You know, we wanted to do death metal at the core, but we wanted to, you know, take take uh, doses of hardcore and grindcore and the kind of ferocity and the, the anger and tension of like of like a of hardcore punk. And kind of bring that in in certain to certain degrees, and that's kind of the thing that I think's kind of given us our uh, identity, and we've really developed that identity over all of our records. And Misery Index sounds like Misery Index, and I think through the records, there's been this kind of like um, uh, wavering back and forth between bringing in more hardcore and more death metal, and kind of balancing it out. Sometimes we have more melody. Sometimes we go a little darker, um, but I think through the through it all, we always push ourselves to to do better and write better songs and and progress, um, but not progress um, to the degree that we lose our identity. I think it's a constant balancing act, to, of course, to to write new songs, and it's, it does take a lot more time to write songs for us now because we're a lot more self-critical so yeah through the two or three years since the last record you know we came up with uh, I guess this album's 34 minutes 34 minutes of music so we've kind of <laughs> we pushed out what we had and uh, yeah it's, it's hard but I think we've managed to keep our sound and I think we've managed to uh, to uh, not repeat ourselves through the years hmm. too much <laughs> Possibly. Also, one other thing I'll add to it is that we're all songwriters, like all three of us write and usually contribute equally to the record. So there's diversity there as well. It's not all the songwriting isn't carried by one person. Okay, okay, okay. So talking about again of your whole discography, can you describe one word each album that you feel until today when you release a new one? Perhaps something like this: Retaliate is aggressive. Discordia is more like savage. Traitor is like amazing work, this kind of stuff. Can you can you tell us each album what represent to you until today when you and perhaps you are waiting the same sensation as your first time when you release this complete control? Um yeah, I don't know if I could give one word to each record, but I could describe like I would say, yeah, the first album Retalia is unhinged. That's probably the most like grind hardcore like crust influenced death metal we've done definitely aiming to be in the uh you know the tradition of napalm death and um, brutal truth and terrorizer and things like that you know do you want me to go through each record or <laughs> <laughs> no depends on you depends on you depends on you perhaps you have a whole word to perhaps you have a whole concept to describe all albums in one budget so it depends on you yeah i mean 
Discordia was a we were not really happy with the way that one came out sonically, like the mix was was not to our liking. So Traders came back and that's that was a little bit more where we wanted to be. Airs of Theory is definitely probably our most death metal album. Um, probably our most technical death metal. We have some aspects on there which are pretty um, maybe even closer to like the fetus roots, I guess. Um, Killing Gods is probably our sort of one of our darkest record. It's like it's the one where we kind of went out a little bit more with, uh, with, with um, the uh, uh, literary elements and stuff. And you know, I think that Rituals of Power represents kind of the stage we're in now, which is I think Complete Control can be seen as a kind of companion record with Rituals of Power. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a lyrically and uh, performance-wise our most kind of refined, I guess, representation of what we've been doing to date. So. Mm. Great, great, great. So, talking about a little history, you <laughs> you did, an, uh, I think, one of the biggest stones into the technical brutal death metal with Dying Fetus and uh, Killing Adrenaline, because this record is an influence for a lot of, a lot of bands especially in Russia, especially in US, a lot of bands do this kind of stuff. So after 25 years of that you release that you re, that you release this album, are you behind this? What do you think about this release? Because you think about this overwhelming receiver around the world and a lot of influence into there for this album because Mr. Endis has this sound too. Has a lot because you have you have you, you did this album with John Gallagher at the first time, so you divided a lot of things, a lot of things happened. So what do you think about this album now, after 25, 24 years? Yeah, Killing on General is like, the, you know, I have a soft spot for that, the second Fetus album. That's like kind of my, uh, my uh, I guess my personal favorite. It's just the one that uh, where it kind of all came together. You know, we got, especially because we found Kevin Talley, the drummer who elevated he his he was so good he allowed us to write whatever we wanted like um compositionally and just expand like what we're doing to uh what we were doing then to like a whole other level so that's i think it just that that on particular yeah it's, it's it has a special place in my heart you know that's where it came together the slam riffs and the you know the tech side everything was kind of balanced out you know gallagher is just a you know he's a riff writing monster you know he's got the <laughs> he has the knack for it and there's just some classics on there for sure mm. uh, okay okay so uh, well, now talking again from your discography, when Adam entered to the band in 2004 after one year of release, after one, oh, well, after one year of release with GL8, and they, they record Discordia, the new album, was the, the, that this Discordia, he, step, step one step to more the technicals, to more, because Adam has a lot of great technical stuff into the drums, so how are you, how you define now? Because when I hear the last work from Adam in Lock Up, this amazing. And now with Mr. Enix, it's amazing too. How do you describe his work around over the years and a lot of development techniques into the drum, the technical grind stuff into the Mr. Enix? Yeah, Adam came aboard in 2004 with us. Yeah. Um, you know, we found, I saw him like opening up in, an, in, his, in his local band, opening up for us, and I just kept in touch with him. And, when we needed a drummer, I called him up. He came out, joined um, in his first show with us was at Fokken in, in Germany. And uh, and he killed it. You know, I mean, when he joined, he's still really young. I would say his playing was a lot more uncontrolled. It was a lot more spastic. And he was trying to fill up fill up a lot of space with a lot of, a lot of beats. And, um, you know, he fit what we were doing then. Um, it definitely started to get more controlled with every year. And uh, and I think, yeah, by the time we did Airs of Fevery, it was super solid, tight, great meter. Um, yeah, and ever since, especially now, since he joined Pig Destroyer in, 20, in 2011, I think, and a few other bands, he's you know, he's playing in diverse types of bands that have really uh, broadened his palette of what, what he's doing. So Misery Nexus benefited from that. 
And I think that, you know, with the last couple hours we've done, he's uh, he's definitely reached the top of his game. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, since the beginning, when I when I when I hear you for the when when I hear the biggest stone into the death metal that is killing adrenaline, your voice has a, a peculiar thing into there. When I hear all the stuff, all this current from Mr. Enix, you have a peculiar thing because I think one of the one of the thirty voices around the world that has a peculiar thing is one of one of one of these thirty one is you because you have a very different very different way to sing. It's very recognizable in all your works and all your sup and all your futures and this in all the songs of Mr. Index. So how do you maintain these sounds since the nineties to now? Because sometimes as as sometimes it's very difficult to achieve this kind of sound by by by, by yourself. Sometimes it's you lost you lost the guttural parts over the times because if we hear the new voice from Barney from Nepal Dead, uh, the first time there's more strong. Now it's, they, they decay a little because over the time, this, 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 these things happen around the world. But your voice is keep the same as the first time. So how do you maintain the voice, the guttural stuff, uh, along more than, well, more than 30 years singing like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, when I, I remember when I started out, like, in the early 90s, I didn't really have a, I was just kind of just doing a low kind of thing. You know, I was really into, you know, John was really into like Frank Mullen, the super deep low thing. I tried to do it. I remember one point on one fetus demo and I, I couldn't really grasp it. I was, you know, I was always kind of more into like the mid range kind of guys like, you know, Carl Willits from Bolt Thrower, Luke LeMay from Gore Guts. Um, those were the kind of ones I thought I was best at. So I think by killing on adrenaline and later, like uh, that's when it started to open up more and get more of a raspy kind of tone going. And I think that uh, at point, certain points, it's gotten a little more unhinged, like a retaliate. This is kind of, it was a little over the top. But I think in recent years, uh, I've kind of like settled down into like a, you know, comfortable upper mid range kind of uh, rasp which is pretty um, in the same area as like John Tardy from uh, Obituary. I think that's kind of like where I'm comfortable these days. And I think, you know, I'm, it's as far as like the technique or whatever, it, I just, you know, I just never push it. Like, if, you know, the thing is when you haven't done it for a while, you have to kind of work up to it. It's like lifting weights. Um, so, so if I haven't sang or screamed, if you will, for like, you know, months, then I, then I might only start off with only doing like 30 seconds of screaming <laughs> and then work slowly up to it. And then, you know, once you've been out on tour for a couple of weeks doing it every night, it's just like talking. You get up there and just let it out. It's just like, so as far as conditioning, it's just, just listening to what your body tells you as far as like going too far in a certain way, or, you know what's comfortable for me, you know, biologically. Um, and I think that it's, it's uh, still seems to work fine, and hopefully it doesn't break down every time soon, but, you know, we're all getting older, we'll see. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, since the beginning, one done one, a huge thing in the, in the career of Mystery Index is that when you release, when, when you record, or when you prepare to, to release the Retail 8, you released by Nuclear Blast at the first time. Then the second album was released. Then the second, third, fourth, and four, four albums. The, then the next three are released by Relapse Records. Then the next two are released by Season of Mist. Then now we are releasing one of the biggest labels too, is Century Media Records. So how do you manage this overwhelming support about the because all these kind of labels are the top labels around the world. It's very difficult to know if perhaps someday, I, I don't know. Do you prefer to, to be to be in the focus all the time? Perhaps do you prefer, uh, do you prefer sometimes to release by underground label sometimes? Because as you know, perhaps Mr. Index is one of the few bands that maintain this label with a, long, with a lot of bigger, bigger labels around the world. Yeah, we've been fortunate um, that, uh, you know, we've, we've had their interest and we've had their support and they've, they've, uh, for the most part, have 
you know, offered us good deals and brought a lot of resources that we could help, you know, raise our stature and get our music to more people. And it's been, uh, you know, that season of Mist, for example, the last one was killer. You know, they're strong, one of the last independent labels in the world. And they did a great job. And, you know, our contract is up with them. And so Century Media made an offer and it was, it was killer. So, uh, you know, it's a lot of times it's just, uh, you know, where, where you are. And if you get an offer for something, it's cool. But, uh, you know, we've always had a kind of underground side through the years. We've kind of retained the right to release our own stuff independently. We have released uh, several um, compilations and uh, like seven inches and, and singles independently on our own imprint on Anarchist Records. So we kind of, you know, like to keep that independent kind of spirit, even though we've had these kind of connections with these uh, you know, international labels. So. <laughs> okay, okay. So, into this matter, what do you think about the when a band belongs to a, a mainstream label like Century Media, Relapse Records, um, Season of Me, because all these labels that you, when you when you release the release the all albums are the mainstream labels around the metal world. So, do you consider as yourself an a mainstream band, or perhaps do you keep you try to keep the maintain the same feeling when you start the the same sensations in the night, like the underground ball all the time, and no are be overwhelming about the mainstream stuff because many people think like this when you enter an, a big label, the band immediately immediately become an a mainstream band. Yeah, it's hard to, to uh, talk about extreme metal in terms of mainstream. I mean, of course, there are like the Slipknots and things like that, which have elevated into like mainstream consciousness. But I still feel like we're firmly rooted in this broader kind of sub level of bands that, um, you know, are with, although we have like support and affiliation with bigger labels, we still um, are part of a broader uh not sub underground, but mid level tier, I guess, of bands that, um, you know, perform in clubs and, and uh, have dedicated modest followings internationally. And I mean, there's no, if anything, we're not changing our sound in any way or anything about us because of these affiliations with these labels. It's just, um, uh, if anything, I think the labels have op opened up more to like the genre and opened up more to supporting it. You know, there is a for them there is a market there. It is you know, it is all about making money for them in the end and you know, to, you know helping get their music out. So yeah, I, I, I would just say that I wouldn't say that there's you know, that these affiliations have made us any any more mainstream or made us. In any sense, <laughs> we're definitely still where we are. And we're, you know, we do what we do okay, and we're pretty happy. <clears throat> okay, okay. Well, talking about other matters, <clears throat> SNR related to the metal world, as I said in one question in the previous one, so that I said that you create a sound that influenced a lot of bands into the into the killing adrenaline. You influence a lot of bands, a lot of people. I'll influence me because I, when I hear this music in the 80s, I hear the, then the 90s, then the thousand. When I hear the killing adrenaline, I said, wow, this kind of music, I really love it. Then when you release this album, you create a lot of new bands into the world. So perhaps do you have time to hear new bands with your influence, with Misery Index influence, with Dying Fetus influence, or with your sound that you create in the 90s? And what do you think about the new bands around the world? Is good or, or bad that, it, that this, this, all this kind of stuff is oversaturated now? A lot of productions, a lot of, a lot of singles, a lot of videos, a lot of compilations. A lot of underground level labels or independent labels is it's very amazing now. So how do you think about these overwhelming releases around the world with your influence? Um, if any, if anybody found influence from what we, what we what I've been a part of, that's awesome. Um, you know, just as I was influenced in the '80s from you know the bands that I got into, and you know when I eventually got to meet them years later, that was big deal for me. I mean, I remember in 19 and 2000 
and dying fetus we got the, we went on tour with destruction open up for them and, and that was blew my mind it was like but um yeah i mean there's more metal than ever there's a lot there's a lot of metal going on right now i mean there's just a lot more of everything because there's a lot more media there's a lot more outlets to get music internationally um to audiences you know you know before before the internet it was like you know a lot of the, the music we hear might be uh you know, relegated to local, regional context, to a certain city, or it wouldn't really make it out of a, a certain area. You know, now with with these platforms, you know, any band can be have an international audience to an extent if they can get their stuff on Bandcamp and get it on streaming services, and you know, and for physical, they tap into the. Uh, you know, the global sort of death metal underground, for example. There's a lot of labels and a lot of trading going on still. It's thriving. Is it too much? I don't know. It just makes it harder, I guess, to cut through the massive bands and really find the ones you really like. It just takes more time. It shows the role of, of uh, curation and curators, like, in the media, like yourself, or, or, you know, the websites and, and metal media to... You know, to advocate and spread the word about good bands. And so, yeah, there's more of everything. I don't, I would never say it's a bad thing, but it is, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, talking about this matter, so the last things that I said is about the, now, as, as I said, it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of stuff coming in the, the digital platforms, in you, like it's, it's iTunes, Spotify, Tidal, this kind of, this kind of digital platforms. And with this kind of, with this kind of relations, you, you see that many bands now are releasing just singles, not releasing complete albums, just releasing EPs. And they pref and now this generation talking about people or, or 25 or 20 or 15 years, they love to do this kind of playlist with the best songs of the album. Well, I prefer I prefer to hear all albums because I have all albums from Misery Index. I'm still waiting for the, my pre-order from the from the new album, so I hope so arrive soon. But <laughs> this new generation is different like us. Also, I I I have 41 years old, and this new generation like to pick one, two, three or four songs into the digital platforms. So for you, why the albums doesn't doesn't have the same impact compared to the well, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And what does band needs to do to improve or to encourage to all list all, all songs in an album? Because now it's very difficult to get attention for this new generation, especially. Yeah, I mean, that's still in the nature of the media. You know, the media is very fragmented today. It's very individuated. It's uh, ubiquitous. Um, people's attention spans are a lot shorter. Um, there's there's constantly new media coming at us all the time through social plat you know these platforms, so you know people are distracted. A lot of there's a lot more other opera things to do from video games to you know there's there's just so much more culture now. So it's you know I, I think I still think metal fans at their heart though you know are, are much more dedicated than maybe in other genres. They have more interest in supporting the bands they like, and they usually take the, the extra step when they find something to, to listen to an album and to you know get the merch and things like that. So it's it's challenging, you know, and it's it's uh, it's just where we are as far as a you know a global and global popular culture like with this. You know, this is you know these are forces which are impacting even, even us and like underground niche music communities like death metal so hopefully we can forge our own identity ahead here for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay oh we are very close to end this interview um jason so and um, one thing one thing that i wanted to ask is about the what are the future plans that that mr index has for this complete control after release this one perhaps and uh Perhaps a European tour, perhaps a North American tour, perhaps more beer, more beer thing coming, or perhaps in the future, perhaps a uh, Latin American tour here in next year, or perhaps this year, or who knows? Yeah, we're going to tour as much as we can. You know, we got a tour in the U.S. coming up in two weeks, um, European uh, festivals this summer, one in the fall. 
we're talking to a guy uh, in Brazil who might be trying to put together a Latin American tour for us. So hopefully <laughs> it'll happen. We'll see. Okay. I, I gotta okay. go. I actually gotta go now. I got the next one here. Uh, yes, 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 yes. So that's the, what it is. So um, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk with you, Jason. Thank you very much for this time. Perhaps you do you want to add? Some, uh, perhaps do you want to add something to Latin American fans and Metalerian readers? Sorry. Perhaps do you want to add something to your med? No. Oh, well, I have to visit there someday. If, you know, I've only been to like Colombia, Argentina, and Brazil. So there's a lot more of latin america i want to see and visit so <laughs> <laughs> okay okay thank you very much